like to invite you to join me in your Bibles in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. In just a moment, I'll begin reading at verse number 14, or you can follow along the text as it appears on the screens. I want to speak on this subject this morning. Jesus, thank you for the cross. If you've ever heard anyone say, why is so much made over the cross? If you'll give me a little while, I'll help you to know why we make so much of the cross. The songwriter said, we cherish the old rugged cross. I bet around the necks of hundreds of ladies and yes, men, many of you are wearing an emblem of execution, a cross. Could you imagine wearing an electric chair around your neck? Could you imagine taking a, a hangman's noose, placing it in a frame and putting it on the wall? How under heaven did the cross you're not supposed to get happy this early into the sermon. But how in heaven's name did the cross ever become so cherished? Because, thank God, thank you for the cross. And so what I want to do in this sermon is I want to talk to you about the cross. And you say, well, how about the resurrection? There would be no resurrection had there been no death. And there could have been death without resurrection, but had there been death without resurrection, there'd be no life. But it is the cross that really magnifies the purpose of God's Son. So having said that, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14, stand with me in honor of the reading of God's Word. What a beautiful sight to look across the room and to see thousands of you as we look into the Word of God. Newsweek recently carried a story that evangelicalism will be unheard of in 10 years. I'll tell you one thing, I don't know how long I'm going to live, but if I'm here in 10 years, there'll be one evangelical still preaching the cross and lifting up God's son. I was asked by church planters in Baltimore where I was speaking the other day. They said, did you read the article? I said, I did. They said, what do you think? I said, do you plan on giving up? Verse 14, I want you to listen to this verse. Some of this passage is very familiar. Other parts of it, you're going to hear maybe like you've never heard before. The Bible says in verse 14, for the love of Christ compels us because we just, we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now, then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Heavenly Father, speak into our hearts. Give us ears to hear and penetrate our soul with your truth. For Jesus' sake, amen. You may be seated. By way of introduction, let me address the motivation behind this message. Paul said the love of Christ compels us. That means that Christ's love has a firm hold that controls the writer of 2 Corinthians. It means he was spurred on by his own sense of that mighty, all-conquering love. Paul went on to say that if one died for all, then all died. Now listen carefully to this statement. Paul believed that mankind as a whole 
was under the sentence of death. And I want to make a statement in the 21st century. So do I. I believe that every man, every woman, every boy or girl that ever breathes the breath of life is under the sentence of death. That's why the gospel is such good news. I'm not here today to elevate myself, to even elevate the body of Christ in the point of putting down those that haven't trusted Christ yet. No, the groundest level around the cross, the Bible teaches that all of us are dead in our trespasses and sins. Because all were dead, Jesus went down into death, and now he brings them up with him in resurrection life if they'll trust him and believe him. This truth reminds us that no person has life in himself. The Bible says in verse 15, Jesus died for all that they may live. So he desires for us to live, but we live through him. The Bible says he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Paul felt with all of his heart that people were under the sentence of death, yet the Lord had given him a message of life. What motivation? Sometimes people ask me, why are you so passionate? Had a family come through the pastor's reception again the other day. It happens about every six months. They had a little children with them. The parents looked at me and said, our son asked a question while you were preaching. I thought maybe he might want to ask you. I looked down. The lad says, Mr. Hunt, why do you holler so much when I'm preaching, when you're preaching? I looked at his parents and I said, so your mom and dad can hear me. <laughs> it doesn't matter what you got to say if nobody can hear you. And by the way, this is not some little menial message that doesn't matter. This is a life-changing message. This is a message that must go forth, not just in our nation, but in the nations of the world. Thank you, Jesus, for the cross. So this motivation of God's love in Christ changed Paul's, listen to this, his evaluation of Jesus Christ and his evaluation of others. Now listen to me carefully. Jesus Christ can change the way you view him. And Jesus Christ can change the way you view others. Saul of Tarsus used to hunt Christians down. He was on his way to Damascus to arrest people and yes, even place them under a death sentence when he met Jesus. There in Syria, on the road to Damascus. And as a result, God changed his life and now he viewed Christians differently and he viewed Jesus Christ differently. Sometimes, and we ought to, we try to convince people to change their view of Jesus Christ. The word is repentance, which means a change of mind. But the truth is only God can give genuine repentance. Only God can really change your attitude and the way you view Christ and other people in the world. Listen to Paul's words again. See if it means more to you. Verse 16. Therefore, from now on, that is, since I've come to be compelled by the motivating force of God's love, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Paul no longer looked at others from a purely human standpoint. His outlook was changed, and now his assessment was different. It was common for people then and now to judge others by such human and external standards as wealth, race, family, background, personality, looks, and skills. You ever heard someone say this and sadly say even in the church, they're not my type people. I want to tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, when you allow God's son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for you and change your life, everyone becomes your kind of people. They're the ones whom Christ, every person you will face today is someone for whom Christ Jesus died. And so Paul said, I'm telling you, I don't look at folk the way I used to. I don't measure them just by what they wear, where they live, the color of their skin. And then he even made the statement about Jesus. Paul no longer looked at Jesus from a purely human standpoint. Have you noticed in the media? Every station you turn to, they're doing a documentary on who is Jesus. If they'd have come this morning, I could have saved them all that research. <laughs> and by the way, if you want to know who he is, find somebody that knows him. <laughs> Paul no longer looked at Jesus from the same perspective. He at one time thought of Jesus as a religious teacher from Galilee. Think with me. 
untrained in rabbinical school, who made messianic claims and alleged to work miracles. However, when then Saul of Tarsus, now Paul the Apostle, met Jesus Christ on the Damascus Road, he was now able to view Christ with an enlightenment that only God the Holy Spirit can give. I didn't want to go to church in my teenage years. Even as I grew into a young adulthood, I didn't want to go. But then I went, and God spoke to me in a message. And on January the 7th, 1973, as a 20-year-old young man, Jesus Christ changed my life. And I'm telling you, he changed my perspective. He changed my view of him. So I want to talk about three aspects of the cross. I want to talk to you, first of all, about the transformation through the cross. The word transformation comes to us in a word, metamorphosis. Metamorphosis is a change not that comes because you have conformed, but it's something that has changed you in the deepest recesses of your being. The Bible teaches that a person can actually be changed inside, inwardly, in your heart, in your soul, in your spirit, through the cross. Verses 14 and six through 16 speak of this transformation in the attitude. Verses 17 and 18 speak of a transformation of actions. One speaks of inward change while the other speaks of outward change. And remember, repentance is a change of mind. And so Christ is changing minds. When the Bible says any man in Christ, it speaks of a new position as well as a new disposition. You see, when a person is transformed by the cross, Jesus Christ comes to live within you. He places his disposition, his disposition and his nature within you. He changes your want-tos. Now, let me tell you how I study my Bible for what it's worth. When I study my Bible, sometimes I see something repeated. And I think, if he keeps saying this, evidently he's trying to get my attention. Let me see if it gets yours. The Bible, in verses 17 and 18, mentions the word things three times. He mentions all things, old things, and new things. He says, therefore, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things, there it is, old things. Verse 19, now all things are of God. Latter part of verse 17, behold, all things have become new. So I just thought, I ought to talk about those three things. So let me mention them quickly. First of all, old things have passed away. Now, what is he referring to? He says, when you come to the place in your life where you surrender and say, you know, Lord Jesus, I realize what you say about me is true. I've sinned against you, and I can't go to heaven in my own strength and in my own goodness. I need God to forgive me, and I need Christ to to become my life and my righteousness so I can be forgiven and go to heaven when I die. And he said, now I just want to tell you, here's the good news about the cross. Any man in Christ is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Now, just what does that mean? Now listen to me carefully. It means all the past is gone. It means every sin of the flesh has been forgiven. So hold, hold on just a minute. What do you mean by that? I mean that when you come to Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ forgives your past, Jesus Christ forgives your present, and Jesus Christ forgives your future. Oh, someone says, now, how can I trust him today and he forgive my future sin? When Christ died on the cross, all of your sins were future. He came to deal with all of them. You mean to tell me I could put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ and he gives me a brand new start. No wonder he called it born again. No wonder he called it uh, cleansed. No wonder he called it forgiven. After a person saved, the old value systems, priorities, beliefs, loves, and plans are gone. Evil and sin are still present. But the believer sees them in a new perspective and things no longer control him. All things. The old. Have gone. But then he says this, and by the way, aren't you great, but he just don't take the old away and leave you the way he found you. But here's what happens when a person comes to Jesus Christ. God deals with the old in your life, but he brings new to your life. It'd be one thing if I told you that managing the pool room, out fighting and drinking, high school dropout, just, I don't even want to admit, mention what was in the past, but anyway, God dealt with it. But he didn't just take that away, it's what he gave me. The Bible says all things have become new. That means the believer can live a brand new existence. The grammar indicates 
that this newness is a continuing condition of fact. Spiritual matters become crucial where once the sinner was dead to them. Jesus Christ performs a fresh work of creation every time a person is saved. And the perfect tense indicates this change has come to stay. I got a letter yesterday. Really blessed me. I've not even told Janet. Came from Carol Tyson. Carol Tyson is the sister of a young man by the name of Ozzy who was married to a girl named Pam. When I was at Falls Baptist Church 28 years ago, I went to Ozzy and Pam's house and led them to faith in Christ. After he got in church and began to grow, he said to me, I've got a sister that needs the Lord. We went over to see his sister Carol, and Janet and I led her to faith in Christ. She wrote me yesterday, and she said, Pastor Johnny, and by the way, I've not heard from her in 28 years. And she said, I just wanted to tell you that to this day, nothing means more to me than my faith in Jesus Christ. It is a continuing condition of fact. It has come to stay. Repentance is never temporary. When someone comes to Jesus Christ, it is everlastingly different. But then he says something else. All things are of God. It's like, now, Johnny, your past is gone. Johnny, new things have come, but let's just give credit where credit's due. All things are of God. Now, what is the all things he's talking about? Well, the first is reconciliation. He's brought us this drastic change. Listen to the language of the New Testament. Now, all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. The word reconciled means changed completely. When God, when God reconciles someone, you, you've been at enmity with God. And the Bible even goes so far as to say that those that haven't trusted Christ are enemies of God. And someone may say, well, I'm not an enemy. Jesus kind of narrowed it down and said, if you're not for me, you're against me. There can be no fence straddlers in the kingdom of God. You've got to go ahead and show your true colors. And so he said, when you're reconciled to God, you are changed completely. It means to affect the change or to exchange. Jesus says, give me your sins. I was talking to my grandchildren the other day. I was preaching to them a little bit. I'd got this sermon in my heart. And they love to play different games. Do you remember the old game, Fish? And you'd say, go fishing. It's your turn. Go. If you remember, just say, uh-huh. All right, got an educated crowd here this morning. Do you remember you'd say, um, give me all your fives. And they'd give you all their fives. And then you'd say, give me all your sevens. Let me tell you what Jesus did. Um, I'm pretty simple-minded. When something gets hold of me like this, I just, I know what I'm going to say, and I get excited prematurely. But listen to this. It's like Jesus Christ one day said to me, Johnny, Give me all your sins. <laughs> I gave them to him. And then I looked at him and I said, Jesus, give me all your righteousness. And he gave it to me. It's an exchange life. What was exchanged? I gave him all my sins. I want to say something to you. I'm not real smart. That's a good deal. That's a, that's a good deal. In fact, it's too good to be true. Through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, sinners have exchanged death for life, heaven for hell, unrighteousness for holiness and depression for hope. Now, to be reconciled refers to God's act of changing man's relationship by moving through Christ's work on the cross, the barrier caused by sin. Now, I need you to really draw in close. Matter of fact, pull your chair up a little bit and listen real carefully to what I'm getting ready to say. When we think about the cross, I'm going to show you two different ways to view it. There is an a objective side of the cross, an objective side. But there's also a subjective side. God could not forgive sin. Man had sinned, and there was no cure for man's sin. But when the Bible says that God reconciled man, it means God made a way for man to be reconciled. God placed himself in the person of Jesus Christ and went to the cross and took the penalty for my sin, paid my sin debt. Now, that made it possible. Now, now there's a message to proclaim. But ladies and gentlemen, listen to me carefully. Before the cross, there was no way for you to be forgiven. So if you want to know what's the big deal about the cross, I'll tell you what the big deal is. You can't know God apart from the cross. 
let me, let me say it a little further. The objective side of reconciliation, it makes salvation possible. There's a song that Scott leads us in, and part of the lyric, Scott says, salvation is here. Salvation is here, and you know how it got here? In the cross. The cross. There was no salvation to proclaim. There was no witness of salvation until the cross. Someone says, how about the Old Testament saints? How'd they go to heaven? They were saved on credit. And they put it on their account. And then, then Jesus at the cross picked up the tab and paid the debt. Abraham got saved by the same cross I did. Reconciliation in the New Testament is not precisely the same thing as salvation. Reconciliation on God's part makes salvation possible. So this aspect of reconciliation makes salvation possible by paying our debt and by removing the obstacle, namely our sin, but it does not save everybody. Somebody says, Christ died on the cross. We're all saved. That's not true. That's universalism, and it's not true to the teaching of the Bible. Christ's death was sufficient for all, but not all are saved. For the benefits of Christ's death are applied to those who will trust Jesus, repent of their sins, put their faith in him. But let me go a step further. I said that was the, that was the objective side. I can teach objective truth. Nobody needs to feel any pressure whatsoever. I'm not asking you to do anything yet. I'm just speaking objectively. But let me go from the reconciliation, talk for a moment about the obligation in verse number 18. The Bible says, and God has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. You may say, well, I didn't ask for it. Well, whether you asked for it or not, he gave it to you. He has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, there is also a subjective side. For this reason, God who reconciled all things that has changed completely our standing, our position in relationship to him, made it possible for us to come to him, has given the means of reconciliation to his servants so they are to proclaim the gospel announcing God's reconciliation to him. Uh, oftentimes there is a major religion in our nation that is contrary to New Testament Christianity. And if I were to go and say to them, have you ever trusted Christ to be your Lord and Savior? They'd say, quit proselyting. I'm already, and they'd name their religion. Ladies and gentlemen, that's not proselytizing. It is reconciling. It is telling people that God gave me a message that the message contains the means of how someone can be reconciled to God. And so I'm to be faithful, and the Bible will say much more about that, and I can hardly wait to get to it. And so what we've seen in this first portion of Scripture I think the Bible has clearly shown us that we can be transformed through the cross. Here's the invitation. If you've never met Christ, you've never repented of your sins, placed your faith in him, been saved, been born again, been reconciled to God, thoroughly changed by Jesus Christ, I would invite you to come to him today. In the balcony, there's two pastors on this side, two pastors on this side, five of us pastors across the front. At the end of every hour, if you'll slip out and come, we'll share with you more about knowing Christ. Maybe you know him, but you've never followed him in baptism and really lived your life for him. When do you plan to do that? You're an ambassador for Christ. You need to either start acting like it or change your name. I encourage you to start acting like it. Number three, I'm going to invite you to respond to your heart's call by the Spirit's voice.